Yes, amen. God is so good. For everyone to whom much is given, from him much will be required. And to whom much has been committed, of him they will ask the more. So, to whom much is given, much will be required. For those that have worked in your first job, think back to your first job. You were just a laborer. I was a bagger. I was bagging grocery. That was my first job, bagger. I was a bagger, and I was a good bagger, too. <laughs> oh, yeah. I look at them bagging grocery now, and I go like, <laughs> give me my bag. Just give me my stuff. <laughs> I loved it. But I wasn't there long because they recognized that what I was doing there was worthy of something even greater. You see, when you're doing what you do to glorify God and to the greatest of your ability, you get advanced. And it's not anyone advancing you. Your advancement comes from God above. That's why we do all that we do. Somebody say all. All, all that you do, you do it as you're doing it unto the Lord, not unto man, because ultimately God is watching. He says, to whom much is given, much is required. But in this second part of that verse, here's the second part. It, it qualifies us. To whom much has been committed of him, they will ask the more. Now, if something has been committed for you, that means it's been set aside for you. But in order to, you receive, to receive that, more is required of you before you receive what's been committed. You get that? See, it's not that you work and you receive it and then you work up to the commitment. You work up to the commitment before you receive it. God has committed so much for us and to us, but we have to be worthy of what God has already committed. King Hezekiah had a sickness, an illness. And God sent the prophet Isaiah to tell Hezekiah that you will die. Get your house in order, Hezekiah, because you're going to die. And then the scripture declares that Hezekiah accepted that and he turned his face to the wall he prayed to God saying God remember me how I've walked with you and he prayed that God would just remember the things that he had already done and that he had been favorable to him and then Hezekiah wept bitterly that moved God God was moved by his compassion and by his intent because Hezekiah didn't ask for more years God give me more years God it's not fair the Bible says he just says Lord remember me and he wept and before Isaiah left the king's courts, God sent Isaiah back and says, go back and tell Hezekiah that I've seen his tears and I've heard his prayer and I'm going to add 15 more years to his life. Now imagine that. You have a death sentence and God grants favor upon you by saying, I'm going to relent. Even though I told you you're, not going, to, you're going to die, I'm going to give you 15 more years. Now whatever number of years, you would be excited about that. I would imagine I would be excited about that if God says, I'm going to give you more time. Now, this more time would not be that God is giving it to me so that I can do just what I've always done. Is that right? God is going to give you more so that you can do what you've always done. I'm giving you more because I'm expecting what? Something from you. See, whatever God gives you, God, there's an expectation with every blessing. God doesn't give you more so that you can do the same. To whom much is given, much is required. So Hezekiah had been given 15 more years. Thank you, God. And then Hezekiah went right back to what Hezekiah had been doing. Look at the scripture here. In those days, Hezekiah was sick and near death. And he prayed to the Lord. And he, meaning God, spoke to him and gave him a sign. But Hezekiah did not repay according to the favor shown him. For his heart was lifted up. His heart was lifted up, therefore wrath was looming over him and over Judah and Jerusalem. He did not repay according to the favor shown him. They mean God expected a response to the favor. But Hezekiah didn't think that he owed God anything. And he didn't pay anything. Thank you, God. I'm so blessed and highly favored. But God had an expectation and why did he do this? The Bible says his heart was lifted up. Pride. Makes us believe that we deserve what we've got. That we worked hard. It's my pedigree. I just knew the right people. I was in the right place at the right time. And you're missing the fact that it was all favor of God. 
Everything that you've got is the favor of God. You do not deserve anything that you've got or what I've got. So I'm always mindful that it's all from God. It's not because of me. It's not because of what I deserve. So Hezekiah suffered because he simply did not repay God for the favor that God had given him. Another king, Nebuchadnezzar. God blessed him and highly favored Nebuchadnezzar. And Nebuchadnezzar built great wealth in a vast city called Babylon. And then he stood out one time on his palace. And he looked out. And he just saw all of Babylon. And you can, you can feel the pride. You can feel it already, right? He's looked out. He says, is not this the great Babylon that I have built? That's how he sounded. That I have built by my wealth and my power. And the Bible says, immediately God struck him. Immediately. And for seven years, he was out of his mind. He was down eating grass like an oxen. Had grown talons like an eagle and feathers. And he was just literally a deranged man for seven years. Because he decided that he wanted to take the glory for what God had done. And after seven years, God allowed Nebuchadnezzar to have his mind back. After seven years. And the first thing he did, God, I give you glory. I give you praise. If we can just do that first. If we can put God first with every day that you get up, every day you wake up, God, I give you praise for just another day. It's not that you deserve another day. Every day is a gift from God. Every day is special. And just wake up saying, God, thank you for another day. That's humility. God, I just thank you for what you give me. Day by day, your blessings come. Your mercies are renewed every day. God, I just praise you. I just glorify you. When you get up and you complain about the day, how's your day? Same stuff, different day. No. Same God, different day. When you know it's the same God that did yesterday, the same God is bringing you another day. Don't take for granted that you're going to be here tomorrow because tomorrow is not promised to anybody. Is that right? All we have is today. So we just give God glory in everything that we do and all that we do today. First Corinthians 2 and 9. But as it is written, I has not seen nor ear heard nor entered into the heart of man the things which God has prepared for those who love him. That means that you have not received yet much of what God has for you. You have not received your greatest yet. God still has greatness in store for you. He says that it's according to those who love him. If you love God, if you position yourself with God, then God says all of these things have been prepared for you. No one can block your blessing. Did you know that? No one can, no one, no one can block your blessing. They can knock you down, step on your face, <laughs> slander your name all over the place. <laughs> but when it comes to the favor, uh-uh. Nobody can touch the favor of God. Nobody can touch the favor of God. You know, Job was the, was the wealthiest man at the time. God called him the greatest man on the earth. Job was blameless. He was upright. He feared God. He shunned evil. And God bragged about Job. And then Satan says, well, Job is just doing this because you blessed him so much. And you don't want to get in that position to where you receive the favor of God and then forget about God. Job was so meticulous about his relationship with God that he did everything he could to maintain that right relationship with God. That means if Job had nothing, Job was still going to do the same thing with God. That's honoring God. If you lose your job, you shouldn't lose your mind. Because God gave you one job, God can give you a better job. Is that right? Whatever is lost or missing, God says, I've got even greater in store for you. And sometimes when, you, when you're getting rid of one, say God is taking away the lesser because God has the greater in store. See, your mind has to already know that God knows where you are and the favor of God is on you so nobody can take away the favor. Things may be lost in your life, but the favor is what you want. And even though Job was stripped down and one day he lost his wealth, he lost his children, he lost his health, started to fail him in one day. Now, if that happened within us, I think that would be a challenge, wouldn't it? If in one day all of these things hit at one day and Job said this, 
Though he slay me, yet will I trust him. Isn't that something? That no matter what, if my skin falls from my bones, yet in my flesh I shall see God. He's saying no matter what happens, I'm still going to lift my hands and praise him. And people around are saying, Job, you must have done something. Come on, Job. Nobody could be that right. And Job says, I don't know. I would love to plead my case to God. But until then, he just, he's not going to charge God against this situation. Satan wants to take control and put you against God. But in order to do that, you gotta believe, he's got to make you believe that you can do it without him. He's got to make you believe that you can do without God. That's pride. We can't do without God. James 1 and 17, just make a note, says every good, James 1 and 17, every good gift, every perfect gift is from above. It comes down from the Father of lights. That means everything in your life that you can be grateful for, everything that is good and right came down from God above. So our attitude should be, God, I thank you. Now, everything may not be perfect in your life, but you don't stop praising God to go and lower yourself to some unrealistic situation in your life. If you can't change it, God, I, I give this to you. I, I give this over to you. God, I'm going to just praise you right now. I can't change what's going to happen. I can't change the loss of a job. I can't change a diagnosis. I can't change a loved one. But God, I can sure give you praise for everything that you're doing in my life right now. And that's what you occupy yourself with. Because there's going to be situations in our lives that we just cannot change and we have to accept. But know that God is able to do what we can't do. God is able to make all grace abound unto us. And as he told Paul, my grace is sufficient for you because my strength is made perfect in your weakness. That when you are weak, God says, now you'll see how strong I am. When you can't do it and then it happens, you have to know that it wasn't about you. You have to know that when you were weak, you allowed me to be God. And sadly, we have to get to a bad situation for us to really turn it over to God. Why don't we just turn it over in the first place? We will hold on to it as long as we can. We keep trying to work it out. And when we can't work it anymore, oh, now it's in God's hand. God's like, well, finally. <laughs> if you could just give it to me at first, you could save yourself a whole lot of pain. But we like to work it out. We pray, and then we take it back from God. We keep working on it. Okay, we got to pray, and I'm going to get back to it and work. We can wear ourselves out with that anxiety. Amen. Let's look at number one. Number one, God's favor brings favor from others. God's favor brings favor from others. God's blessings and favor are for those who are willing to be obedient to his word and keep his commandments. King Saul was the first king of God's people. And Saul was such a humble person. God loves humility. When you are humble, God says, I exalt the humble. But if you exalt yourself, God says, then I will have to humble you. But what happened was King Saul was in a high position. And no matter how humble you are right now, if you had a lot of money and people started to honor you and give you position and authority and, and holding you up real high, I think even the most humble of us over time might start to feel a little proud. You say, no, pastor, not me. Saul did it. Many others in the Bible did it. When they first were going to bring Saul together to do his ordination for his, for his kingship, he was a young man. All these people are waiting for him and they couldn't find him. He was hiding somewhere in the baggage because he didn't feel that he was worthy to be ordained king of God's people. That's humility. But it didn't take long for Saul to say, wait a minute, you mean I'm king of all of this? And I can say, do this and you do it. And I can say, I want this and you'll bring it to me. And you start to feel a little bit full of yourself. And the Bible says, do not think too highly of yourself than you ought to. Do not think too highly of yourself. So Saul was told by Samuel the prophet, God says, go and destroy the Amalekites. Destroy everybody. Kill the sheep. Don't take any spoil for yourself. Destroy everything. Take nothing for yourself. So Saul went down with this one mission 
And Saul decided that he would keep some of the sheep. That he would take some of the spoils. That he would spare the king. And then Samuel came to Saul and said, Saul, did you complete the mission? He says, yes, I did. Did you destroy everything? Yes, I did. He says, why do I hear the bleeding of sheep and the lowing of cows? And who, why did you bring the king out? And then Saul came up with excuses. He says, well, that's all for God. I was bringing this for God. You see, God doesn't give you a command and then let you lean on your own understanding. When God gives you a, a, a choice or gives you an assignment, you're meant to complete that assignment and what God says do, that's what we do. Samuel said, has the Lord as great delight in burnt offering and sacrifices as in obeying the voice of the Lord? Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice. God wants obedience for you to do what God says do. That's better than any sacrifice that you can make. Coming to church on Sunday should not be a sacrifice. Coming to church on Sunday should be the privilege that you know to be in the presence of the living God. Amen. It should not be difficult for you to come to church. It shouldn't be like, ah, got to go to church today. And after that, I can go and have some fun. <laughs> no, you should come to church to give God glory and praise. Yeah. To lift him up. Yeah. Church should leave you, you should leave church feeling re revived <laughs> and renewed. It's all about that relationship. You shouldn't leave church feeling tired and wore out. You should, you should come to church with thanksgiving and praise. And when you open up, God begins to fill you. And when he comes in, he fills all of that stuff that, that nothing else can fill. And if we can't allow that to happen, we've gotta, you've got to work on that relationship. It's all about that relationship. And when we give, when you give, let's say whatever you give as an offering, if it's a sacrifice for you, it's about relationship. It's about relationship. If you figure, okay, I give, okay, pastor was okay today, I give him a, I'll give him a couple extra bucks. It's not about that. Our church was good today, so I'll, I'll give a little extra. Okay, they're asking for more money for something, I'll give a little extra. When you have the right relationship, you give it all. You give it all. Because you know that you can't beat God giving. That no matter what you can give, God says, because you have loosed that, I've got so much more in store. But if we think that we have to control it all, it's mine. And I'll just break God off. Okay. God says, no, it's mine. What you have is a trust. God entrusted you with whatever you have. And the Lord gave it and the Lord could take it away like that. Like that. There are people who are wealthy and they can't enjoy their wealth because they have no peace of mind. When they have no peace of mind, that means they're weary all the time, they're worried, they're thinking about people taking away from them, and they cannot enjoy what they have worked so hard for. Because to have all of that and not have God means you have nothing. But to have nothing and have God, you've got everything. And that's the idea, to know that I, I would rather have God than silver and gold. I'd rather have his presence, his favor than everything else that could be out there. It's all about that favor of God shining upon us. Number two, God's favor follows you wherever you go. First, God's favor brings favor from others. As you know, Joseph was a favorite of his father. And then God allowed Joseph to be sold as a slave. And once he was sold as a slave, he was bought by an officer named Potiphar and God allowed that whatever Joseph did in Potiphar's house to prosper the favor was on Joseph but Potiphar received the blessing now Potiphar wasn't favored Joseph was favored but the blessing was born those that Joseph was serving see sometimes God's favor would be upon you and you would be in a position of service as you're watching other people benefit from your favor. But that's because God says, I want you to be humble in low position. When you're in a low position, and you're just serving God. Do it as if you're in the highest position. Give all that you can. That's what I tell my children. No matter what job you're doing, do it to the best of your ability. Because ultimately God is watching you. 
And God was watching Joseph. Now, God had a position for Joseph. He says, I'm going to put him second in command to Pharaoh. Joseph didn't know that. All Joseph knew that he was working as a slave in this officer's house. He did it to the greatest of his ability. And everything in part of his house began to flourish. Favor of God. When you see favor happening around you, God does not allow you to see that unless he has greater in store for you. Keep doing all you can so that God can be seen. You want him to be seen for what you do. When you do things to the highest order, people began to say, you know something? You're a Christian, aren't you? Something in your giving and what you're doing would allow God to be seen in the lives of others. When you do it ultimately to him. Because I've never seen anybody so happy about sweeping a floor. <laughs> Got to be God. Anybody saw Coming to America? Good movie, right? When you think of garbage, think of Hakeem. <laughs> He's not your regular dude. You know, I am Hakeem. I mean, whatever position he was doing, he did it to the greatest of his ability. But what they didn't know that he was a prince. You see, you're a prince. You're a child of the most high God. Amen. You're not of this world. Your kingdom, your citizenship is in glory. So everything that you do brings glory to your father. That's why people say, well, how can you be so happy? How can you be so humble? We're doing the same job, but you come here smiling all the time and you're full of joy because I don't do it for you. I do it for my father, which is in glory. That is why you do what you do. It's not so that people, it's not so that people can honor you and talk about how good you are. Ultimately, they should look at you and say how good God is. Because you're his child. When you come from a certain family, I heard a, a couple uh, people at our bench talking yesterday. They said their father taught them certain things. He says, always show up early. If you've got to be there at 10 o'clock, always show up early. And there are certain things that they do right now that honors their father. When you honor your heavenly father, there's certain things that you do that exceeds the expectations of everybody around you. People have a standard, but then God has a standard for you. Don't go to the lowest standard. Do all you can to get by, and the best you can not to get caught. That's not a good standard. You're meant to be exceptional. You're meant to lead the way, because God ultimately wants to do something great in you. And they will, you'll see the people around you will watch how you're being elevated. And they're saying, I knew something was special about this person. Because way back when we started together, there was something about this person, meaning you. Last one. God's favor does not leave you empty-handed. When God was going to bring the Israelites out of Egypt, he says, I will not leave you empty. Because God knows where we are, and when we're faithful to him, God has blessings and promises in store. And many of the promises are in Deuteronomy 28, Deuteronomy chapter 28, we talks about all the blessings shall come upon you and overtake you if you diligently follow the voice of the Lord your God. There's something God expects. Obey him. Listen to him. Be diligent. Do all that you do as unto the Lord and not for man. The favor of God comes upon you. When he told the, the Israelites, when I bring you out, I'm not going to bring you out poor. I'm going to bring you out with great possessions. And here's what he said. I will give this people favor in the sight of the Egyptians. And it shall be when you go that you should not go empty handed. But every woman shall ask of her neighbor articles of silver, articles of gold and clothing. So you shall plunder the Egyptians. So whatever they asked for, they received. When you have favor with God, Whatever you can even think, ask, or imagine, God has already given it to you. But when you see the favor, you don't want the stuff anymore. When God is in your life, there's a point to where the stuff just don't matter. Can anybody understand what I'm talking about? Yep. When you've had some stuff, you recognize it's just stuff. You've had the cars, you've bought, had the money, you've done things, it's just stuff. So the greatest thing that you can have is God's favor. That's the blessing. The favor of God follows you everywhere you go. 
When people look at you, they see the favor of God. That's a wealthy person. You're truly blessed. I look at some of you and you're glowing. And you're glowing because of the favor of God on your life. Every believer should glow. We go out into a dark world and the world needs light. And that light doesn't come from you. That light comes from God in you. And when they see you shining and glowing for Jesus, they're going to want to come to you and say, what must I do to be saved? Because I've, I've worked all my life and I look at you and you're just a glowing presence. There's something about you that makes their heart long for more of Jesus. And we would strive to do that for the favor of God. You won't have to go out and invite people to church. They will follow you wherever you go. Father, thank you that we can be favor-minded knowing that it's not about possessions.